Hello, my name is Sandy Chang. I am the Associate Dean of STEM Education and Undergraduate Research, and also a professor in the Departments of Laboratory Medicine, Pathology, and Molecular Biophysics and Biochemistry. Today, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my research and also tell you about my role as the Associate Dean of STEM Education at Yale College. So my interest in, is in the area of aging research. So why do we age? This is a question that has fascinated the human species for centuries, and we know that as we age, our organ systems fail. But is there a biological determinant of why we age? So it turns out that the accumulation of old cells or senescent cells is one of the main determinants of why we age. So on the left, you can see that uh, the cells have undergone only two or so cell divisions. They look normal with oval nuclei and plump cytoplasm. On the right are cells that have gone 60 population doublings or divided 60 times. These cells clearly look abnormal. They have flattened cell uh, morphology and very strange looking nuclei. These cells are what we call senescent cells and aging humans and all other ma mammals accumulate these type of cells to promote cellular aging and also organismal aging as well. So why is there a magic number of 60 cell division? And it turns out there is actually a biological clock in every one of our cells that govern the number of cell divisions a cell can undergo. And this biological clock is called telomeres. These are TTH, EGG repetitive DNA sequences at the ends of all our chromosomes. And as telomeres shorten, they trigger a DNA damage response, which then elicits the onset of cellular senescence. You can see here graphically on the panel um, below that chromosomes are illustrated by this blue bar and telomeres are these red boxes at the ends of the chromosomes. As the cell divide, telomeres gradually shorten and telomeres with the shortest length are the ones that trigger the onset of cellular senescence. And these are, uh, again, cells that stop dividing and give rise to a premature aging phenotype. On top are TRF southern blocks that shows the length of telomeres. Telomeres are heterogeneous, that's why they look like a smear, but you can see under the senescent cells, all the telomeres are very, very short. What is very interesting is that you can actually convert a senescent cell into a fast dividing immortal cell if you express an enzyme that maintains telomere length, an enzyme called telomerase. You may have heard about this enzyme during your studies. Telomerase converts senescent cells into immortalized cells, but these cells are now endowed with the ability to become cancerous. So there's an intimate connection between aging and cancer, and this is one of the reasons why we see cancer primarily in old individuals. So telomeres are not only repetitive DNA sequences, they're also capped by a series of proteins called the sheltering complex, and these proteins are what we study in my laboratory. These proteins interact with the enzyme telomerase to maintain telomeres in a capped state, again, promoting genome stability and telomere growth. So in the absence of telomerase or mutations in sheltering complex, give rise to telomeres that we call dysfunctional. They are no longer protective. They elicit a DNA damage response, which is read by a protein called P53. You may have heard of this protein. This is the guardian of the genome. In the setting of an intact P53, the telomere dysfunction is then triggering cellular senescence leading to the onset of aging phenotype. However, in the absence of P53, cellular senescence is not elicited. In fact, genome instability then triggers the onset of a cancer. Again, this intimate relationship between aging and cancer. So one of the proteins that I study in my lab and also by my undergraduate students is a protein called protection of telomere one or POT1. And what we found is that POT1 accumulates many mutations that prevents it from binding to telomeric DNA. You can see that by this blot. POT1 mutations listed on top can no longer bind to a TTAGG oligonucleotide, hence the blank signal here, stating that POT1 mutations uh, abrogate the protective function of this protein, leading to telomere dysfunction and the onset of cancer. So I want to switch gears a little bit and tell you how students in my laboratory actually uh, get to work with me. So my laboratory is only one out of almost a thousand laboratories that Yale hosts. And many of the lab's uh, PIs, or pr pr principal investigators, are very prominent, uh, renowned scientists. 
We have Nobel Prize winner, MacArthur Genius Grant awardees, and also Alaska Award winners. This is all good and fine, but if you cannot get to work with any of these famous scientists, what is, uh, you know, this does nothing for you as a, as a student. I want to tell you that it is very easy and very possible for undergraduates of all levels to work with uh, a Yale professor. And in fact, undergraduate research is an integral part of your STEM education. So you can see here in these various po uh, fi uh, pictures, students presenting their posters of their research progress to scientists. And this is actually me and my student, Lydia, who did the research on the POT1 mutation that I just told you about. So again, undergraduate research is intimately linked to indep independent research in a laboratory. So as a dean of uh, STEM education undergraduate research, I have money dedicated to fund uh, Yale Summer Research Fellowships. So I have about over a million dollars, and I fund 250 fellowships that are given to students over the summer so students can actually work with Yale professors. And the majority of this money is actually uh, geared to support first years because I really believe that first year students should get into a lab as soon as they're able to. So first year students are supported by a fellowship called the First Year Summer Fellowship, uh, Summer Research Fellowship. And this is research that supports 10 to 12 weeks of independent research that you would do with the Yale faculty of your own choosing. You don't have to have any research experience whatsoever. The professors will teach you how to conduct research in a laboratory. And you can see that the funding rate, and also practically every student who applies for this fellowship gets it, so the funding rate is actually very, very generous. If you're a sophomore and junior, you can also apply for the Dean's or the Rosenfeld uh, Research Fellowships, and these are paid at the same rate. A little bit less able to get it, but you know, 80% funding rate is still a very respectable number. If you want to go abroad and work with a professor in another institution in another country, there are fellowships that enable you to do this. The title and the debates allow you to travel to a foreign country and work with a foreign researcher that you identify. So you just have to put together a research proposal and this fellowship will enable you to work with professors in a foreign country. We have, prof we have students in the past who've gone to Germany, China, and et cetera to work over the summer on a research project that they helped design. If you are a student on financial aid, there are two additional awards. One is called the Domestic Summer Award, which enables you to take $4,000 and work at a local institution near your home. So if you don't want to stay at Yale over the first summer, you can always work at a local institution using your Domestic Summer Award. You're also possibly eligible for the International Summer Award, which you could take this money again to go abroad and work with a foreign uh, faculty. So the second program that I run through my office is a program called the Science, Technology, and Research Scholars Program, or STARS. STARS is a program with a 25-year history, which is geared for women and other underrepresented students uh, in the science and engineering. So this is a cohort of students who did a program called STARS Summers, which I'll tell you about in a second. So STARS has four components. The first one is called STARS One, is geared for first-year students. STARS Summer is for 30 students to continue research over the summer after their uh, first year. STARS Faculty and Student Dinner is a program in which I link Yale faculty with uh, STARS sophomores. And STARS 2 is geared for juniors and seniors to do research. So the STARS 1 program, again, is for your first years. We have increased the program now to be uh, over 100 students. These students are women or underrepresented students. and they are mentored by 13 peer mentors, which guide the students in terms of their STEM education, classes to take, summer experiences, and also we do a lot of uh, monthly res uh, workshops catering to research and other STEM activities as well. The one-on-one -on -one advising from the peer mentor has been shown to be instrumental in the success of many of our STEM students who undergo this program. STAR Summer Research is the crown jewel of this program. This is for 30 rising sophomores. All students in this program do independent research with the Yale faculty of their choosing. They also take a class uh, in which they earn one writing credit. So this class will teach the students how to read research papers, how to present research, uh, their research, et cetera. We have weekly um, uh, social activities for, to promote bonding and interaction. 
and there's a $2,500 stipend coupled with full room and board support. The STARS faculty and student dinner are for 30 uh, sophomores and first years, and I choose Yale faculty to come and talk to the students about their science, about their research, and also about the pathway to science and the challenges they're facing, because I think it's important for um, STARS students to hear about potential challenges that their own professors have faced and how they overcome them. So these are, um, these meetings always foster live in, um, interactions, and this is what a important component of this program is all about. The STARS II program has been expanded to now include almost 30 students, and this is to fund students, juniors and seniors, during their full two years to do academic research uh, at Yale. So as you know, all the other fellowships that I talked about are for summer research. So this is the one program which we actually fund students who participate in academic research during their academic year. So students can work up to 10 hours a week, and they work with a mentor of their choosing, and I highly encourage students who have enough data to actually present their data in national and international conferences, um, which will give them a lot of recognition. Students work in all parts of Yale, so here are some images. This is the Allen Center of the Medical School, Chemistry Building in Kroon Hall over at Science Hill, and West Campus has a whole slew of Yale researchers. One of the pictures that I should have included, what I didn't have, is the new biology building, which is a beautiful building where many of our biologists now work. So I want you to consider Yale um, because of its small college, residential college experience. So you could think about Yale as a small liberal arts college in the center of an internationally renowned research university. So we have the best of all worlds, small college field, coupled with the resources of a, uh, of a powerhouse research university. I just want to end with a quote from our president, President Salovey, that Yale is a research university most committed to teaching and learning. And this is the website that if you have time to, for you to, take a, uh, to browse and take a look at the number of fellowships and activities that I offer through the Yale College Dean's Office. Thank you very much for your attention.